Okay, so this is the Unit 4 module video on colligative properties. Here we are going to be focusing on the colligative properties specifically related to, well, for all of the colligative properties, but then the ones that you're going to be using in lab we spend just a little bit more time on. We're going to also be calculating molar mass, the amount of moles, just from those colligative properties. So in terms of where we are in the unit, we are going to be focusing here. We've got vapor pressure, freezing point, depression, boiling point elevation, osmotic pressure, and then we're going to talk a little bit about applications because I always think it's nice to know why we care. So colligative properties are the properties of solutions that depend only on how many particles are dissolved and not on what it is. We do not care if it's NaCl, uh, K KBR, um, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the total number of solute particles that are present. Now, with that being said, the more particles that you have in solution, the more you are going to see a decrease in vapor pressure, a decrease in freezing point, a really a, um, an elevated an elevated boiling point and then you're also going to see an in, a change in osmotic pressure here. It's going to be really kind of interesting how these things happen. So in terms of vapor pressure, vapor pressure is just the amount of pressure exerted by the particles that are above the surface of the solution. Now generally what happens, especially we've got a closed vessel here, You've got gas particles that are leaving and bouncing away into the gas phase. You've also got gas particles that are bouncing in and all of a sudden they become incorporated to the liquid. This is happening at equilibrium, equal rates. So you have liquid particles conforming to gas, gas becoming back to liquid. It is going to be the same. It's going to be constant. And so whenever you dissolve, so just a pure solvent, you have a vapor pressure. But when you dissolve a non-volatile, meaning it's not going to leave solution, a non-volatile uh, solute, it is going to interact with that solvent. It, those interactions are going to want to keep the particles present in this solution more, and it's going to lower the overall vapor pressure. Oops, stop. Now, we can calculate the vapor pressure of a uh, component using Routes law. Here the, P, the partial pressure of component A is equal to the mole fraction of that component times the vapor pressure when it's completely in its pure form. And so you can kind of see here, again, pure solvent, we have things going into the gas phase, things coming into the liquid phase, it's at equilibrium. But when you have solute molecules, all of a sudden these can interact more. They are going to be less likely, there's fewer arrows here, to go into the gas phase. They're going to be more likely to stay in that liquid solution. We can kind of also relate this if you are a numbers person, if you're one of my engineering students. The partial pressure of A, as it gets to be pure, is going to be equal to the vapor pressure of the pure substance. But as the mole fraction goes down, uh, the, the partial pressure is also going to, um, I mean, as the mole fraction goes down, so does the overall vapor pressure of this, the, that substance. Okay, so let's compute the vapor pressure of an ideal solution containing 92.1 grams of glycerin and 184.4 grams of ethanol at 40 degrees Celsius. Vapor pressure of pure ethanol is 100, 0.178 atmospheres at 40 degrees Celsius. Glycerin is usually non-volatile. Okay, so let's go ahead get my pen. Now, if we need mole fraction, that's what this is, mole fraction, we need to get the mole fraction before we can do anything. And so we have to find grams to moles of glycerin and grams to moles of ethanol. 
Actually, we're going to write this down here. I'm going to do color coding. And grams to moles of ethanol. Now, in terms of going from grams to moles, we need our molar mass. So I'm going to come up here and do a table. Atom, number, grams in total. For glycerin, C3H5O3, 3. So that means we have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Three hydrogens plus five is going to be eight, and then three oxygens here. This is 12.01 from the periodic table, 16, and 1.01. Gives us 36.03 plus 48 plus 8.08. Or overall, 36.03 plus 48.00 plus 8.08 .08 ends up being 92.11. For ethanol, might as well do it all together. Number, charge, I mean grams in total. Here we've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Two carbons. Five plus one is six hydrogens and one oxygen. It gives us 12.01, oh, sorry, 1.01 and 16. So total we have 24.02, 2 times 12, 6.06 .06 and 16.00. Or 24.02 plus 6.06 .06 .06 plus 16 gives us 46. 0 0.08 grams per mole. So we have our molar mass. We can now get to moles. You see I'm setting you up for lab here. So here for glycerin we had 92.1 grams and 92.11 grams in one mole. So this ends up giving us a nice one mole. Or Nine, nine, 0 0.9999. So to have the right number of sig figs, I'm going to go ahead and say 1.00. For ethanol, here we've got, uh, where to go? 184.4 grams. We know that 46.08 grams is in one mole. So 184.4 divided by 46.08, this is 4.002 ethanol. Four, four should have four sig figs. So mole fraction, oops, I need to figure out how to disconnect the shortcuts. Mole fraction is the moles of our component over the total moles. Because we're only going to be dealing with ethanol, we're going to have 4.002 moles over 4.002 plus 1.00. 4.002 divided by parentheses 4.002 plus 1.00 gives us 0 0.800 mole fraction. Oh, for goodness sake. So Routes law says you're going to take the pressure of the component at when it's pure times the mole fraction to get its partial pressure. So our partial pressure of ethanol is equal to x times the initial. What is that? So this gives us 0 0.800, seriously, times 0 0.178 atmospheres. So 0 0.800, I'm not even touching it, times 0 0.178. The partial pressure at this, uh, with this solution is going to be 0 0.142 ATMs.
So that's how uh, vapor pressure works. Boiling point elevation is also important. Um, you may have heard the old wives tale that if you add salt, it makes the water boil faster for a pot of water. That is actually false. What is really happening is it elevates the boiling point. So you don't get those little bubbles, which take forever to kind of take off. What instead happens is it, the water doesn't boil until a higher temperature, but it goes from not boiling to a rapid boil pretty quickly. It takes longer in time, but it makes you feel like it's faster. Okay, so boiling point um, elevation is represented by this, where we have a change in boiling point is equal to some constant times the molality, not molarity, molality of the solute times the Van Hoff factor. The Van Hoff factor accounts for the number of particles in the solution. So if we were talking about NaCl, NaCl is a group one metal, so it's soluble. You get Na plus plus Cl minus. There are two particles, Na and Cl. So the Van Hoff factor here would be two. For MgOH2, eh, let's do, let's do, what do I want to do? K2CO3, potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate has is soluble because you've got a group one metal. You end up getting two potassium ions and a carbonate ion. Two plus two potassiums plus one carbonate. Here our Van Hoff factor would be three. If you talk about something like glucose or ethanol, those do not ionize. So whatever you get is the same number, okay? It would just be one. So boiling point elevation is going to be calculated this way. Usually what's going to happen is you are going to find the molality of the solution and that's going to allow you to find the change in boiling point because you can plug it in by multiplying molality times the constant times your I. Then if you know the original boiling point, you know the change in boiling point, you can go in and find the new boiling point. So let's do an example. Oh, oops. <laughs> I'm ahead of myself. So let's talk about Van Hoff factor for ag again. Remember, this is going to have to do with only the number of particles, not the number of atoms. It's how many particles are contributed. So KCl, K plus Cl is going to be two. Potassium nitrate, potassium plus the nitrate ion, that's two. Here we've got sodium phosphate, three sodiums, one phosphate, so our I is four. The point here, guys, is because co uh, colligative properties only depend on amount, not identity, the more you have, the higher that Van Hoff factor, the much bigger the impact. So what's the boiling point of an aqueous solution? That is 0 0.25 molality glucose or molal glu glucose. Kb for water is this. Well, if we go back to that formula, it's the delta T is equal to the Kb times the molality. Goodness gracious. Times the I. We are given the K. We're given the molality. Technically, we know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, so we have one of the temperatures. And glucose does not uh, dissociate as a sugar, so our I is going to be 1. Let me rewrite this a little bit. Now, the way I kind of think about this is Tf minus the initial boiling point, the one that's normal, is equal to Kb times the molality times your I. So if we plug this in, we don't know what our new boiling point is, but we know we have 100 as our initial, is equal to our K, 0 0.512, times our molality, which is 0 0.25, now, glucose does not dissociate, so our I is just 1. 
So this is going to give us so far, if I multiply just on the right side, 0 0.512 times 0 0.25 times 1, t minus 100 is equal to 0 0.128. Add 100 to both sides. Our boiling point of this solution is going to be 100.128. Um, sig figs, that's going to be 2 actually, so this should be 1, 3. This is exact, so I'm going to leave it this way um, just because it is, um, 100 really is ex an exact number here. I could have written 100.00. So what would it be if we had an aqueous solution that was the same concentration of MgCl2? Well, MgCl2 is different because when this dissociates, we get magnesium and two chlorides. So one plus two, our I value here is three. So we can set it up the same way, T minus 100, aqueous solution, is equal to 0 0.512 times the molality times the Van Hoff factor of three. So again, we have 100 times uh, is equal to zero point five one two times point two five times three, which ends up giving us zero point three eight here. Now adding one hundred to both sides, T is equal to one hundred point three eight. So just adding the same um, concentration, you get a much bigger impact here. may not seem like it, but that's a bigger difference. Freezing point depression works exactly the same way. Because of the interactions that are in that liquid phase, it's not going to want to change to uh, the solid. It's going to want to stay as a liquid. And that's really going to um, be a big deal. This, the really, the only difference here, the change in freezing point is equal to the K of the freezing point times M times I. I have to give you these constants. I, I mean, I don't know them. I don't know why you would know them. Um, the freezing point is going to go down. And so a lot of the time you're going to see your KF values are actually going to be negative, which is, you know, fine. Now, we use freezing point a lot of the time. This is uh, something you see a lot up north where they start calling for frost. What will happen is the trucks go out with a, a salt. Now, I don't know exactly which salt they use, but I know it's not NaCl because what they want to do is choose a salt that has more like, and this is not it, but uh, Al2SO4 3. This has got five, two aluminums, three sulfates. This only has two. You want a Van Hoff factor that is going to be really high. And so as soon as it starts to call for frost, they go and put stuff on the road so that it does not freeze. Now, we also see this on a regular basis on things like uh, de-icing of planes. You go spray a solution on the plane when it goes up to the high altitudes where the temperature is so low, it doesn't freeze, which is good because you want to be able to move those parts of the plane and, you know, not crash. Now, we can also talk about how the solution will decrease the freezing point, raise the elevation point in coolant. And I think that's an example I have in a couple minutes, so I'll go away from that. Now you are going to take advantage of this in lab because we do a lab on freezing point depression. It's much easier to monitor freezing point than it is boiling point. Freezing point elevate. Um, this should be depression. Oops. The freezing point change constant, molality, and the Van Hoff factor. Now for you, there's a couple of ways that these problems can work. You can get the molality. Once you have the molality, you can plug it in and find your change in freezing point. And then if you know the original, you can find the new one. In lab, you are actually going to monitor the freezing point 
of a solution. Now you know from one of the previous units that when you are freezing or changing phase, the temperature is actually constant. It doesn't change here. And so the way that you are going to tell that it is freezing is that your temperature is going to be constant. Now, one of the first mistakes that people make is they forget to stir. You have to stir constantly. If you are not stirring constantly, it's the same as when you get frost on your windshield or something in the middle of the winter. You're going to get some of it to start to freeze and then it's not going to have an equal temperature all the way through. You have to stir it consistently and constantly to have that freezing point be really reliable. The next mistake people make is you know your freezing point and you know your old freezing point so you can get your change here. That's going to give you your delta T. Well if delta T is equal to K, M, and I you can quickly use T and K, divide by K, T over delta T over K is equal to M times I. Now we tell you what the I is um, each semester, so I'm not going to bring that up in case we change it, just make sure you're paying attention. But you can get your molality. Well remember that molality is moles per kilogram. So in order to go from moles per kilogram to moles, you have to multiply by kilogram. Now, when you're measuring your solution, you do it in grams. So I guarantee about 30% of the class will forget to go from grams to kilograms before completing this part of the calculation. So when you put something on the scale in grams, make sure you convert it to kilograms before you try to cancel here. You can't just plug in grams like that. It doesn't work. It's not going to cancel. So make sure you've converted. Once you have kilograms canceled, um, you can get your moles, and from moles you'll get to the molar mass. So let's do an example here. We used to actually do this specific lab in this specific experiment in lab. We stopped because Benzene doesn't smell good. You don't want to be breathing it in all the time. All the time, it's got some uh, other inherent hazards present, but mostly it stinks. So now we do it with an aqueous solution, and um, even though the data is a little less reliable, nobody leaves the room with a migraine anymore. So, but this is the lab that we used to do. Benzene normally freezes at 5.5 degrees Celsius has a KF value of negative 5.12 degrees Celsius per molal. Calculate the molar mass of a non-volatile solute if a solution containing 3.75 grams of a non-electrolyte dissolved in 61 grams of benzene is found to freeze at 2.82 degrees Celsius. Oops, highlighter. Now, here we have our initial freezing point, our new freezing point, we have our KF value, and it tells us non-volatile, it really should say non-volatile, non-ionizing, but it means we have our I value as well. So if we go into our formula, T minus T, the initial temperature is equal to KFMI. So let's plug in what we know and just kind of talk about it a little bit. Where is that shortcut? So we know initially it was at 5.5. Oops. Five point five zero. The new freezing point is 2.82. Our KF value is negative 5.12. Times our M times an I value of 1. Okay, so here we can go ahead and on the left 2.82 minus 5.50 gives us negative 2.68. That is equal to negative 5.12 times M. This times 1 is just that. 
So to get m by itself, we're going to divide both sides by negative 5.12. And that is going to give us a molality of 0 0.523 moles per kilogram. That is how concentrated our solution is here. Now, kilogram solvent. Now, if we wanted to find the molar mass, we have we need to get from moles per kilogram to just moles, which means we have to cancel kilograms of solvent. This is where everybody messes up in lab, guys. We have 61 grams of benzene. Grams, kilograms, doesn't work. So you have to make sure you take the time to follow your units there's a thousand grams in one kilogram, so 0 0.0610 kilograms of benzene. At that point, we can get to uh, moles. So we're going to multiply by 0 0.0610 kilograms. That is going to allow kilograms of our solvent to cancel 0 0.523 times 0 0.061 zero is equal to 0 0.039 moles. Now to find molar mass, molar mass is equal to grams per mole. We have grams, we have our moles, so we can just plug it in. So this is 3.75 grams of that solute over 0 0.0313 moles of that solute, which is equal to 117.54, three sig figs, three sig figs, so it ends up being 118 grams per mole. Now guys, the big takeaway here is that the whole thing is the more you have in solution, the more interactions that are occurring, the more it is going to expand this phase diagram in terms of how long the solution can stay a liquid. It's going to decrease your freezing point, it's going to increase your, your boiling point, it's going to really ensure that you are in that liquid phase longer. Now, when we talk about osmotic pressure, now guys, let me go back for a second. This is of a non-electrolyte. It's really just any solution. Um, this is the title here because they were using Van Hoff factors of one. Um, but electrolytes, non-electrolytes, doesn't matter. If there are interactions, it's going to increase the time that it's a liquid. So osmotic pressure is um, when you have, okay, so osmosis is when you have the solvent flowing through a semipermeable membrane to make the concentration of solvent as close to equal as possible. Um, it is, you know, kind of like if you try to sleep on your textbook and you are hoping osmosis will send the information from the book to your head. That kind of thing it goes from the concentrated textbook to, to, to us. So osmotic pressure is defined by the capital pi, um, which doesn't really look like it for some reason in this font. It should be more like that, uh, but it looks like an N for some reason. It is equal to the Van Hoff factor times the molarity of the solution. Again, now we're in molarity, not molality, times the gas law constant times the temperature in Kelvin. Now, What's going to happen is you usually have a solution that's got solute versus a side that has no solute. And so the solvent is going to flow from the side with the solute, without the solute, to the side that has the solute. Um, generally what's going to happen is this membrane is permeable to the solvent but not to the solute itself. 
and the idea is to try and get as close as possible to equal solute concentrations. So this is usually used for water purification and other types of things. So what's the osmotic pressure of a 1.35 molar solution of NaCl at 25 degrees Celsius? Well, if we go to the equation, the equation is osmotic pressure in atmospheres is equal to the Van't Hoff factor times the molarity times the gas law constant times the temperature in Kelvin. Now, the reason we have Van't Hoff and molarity is we have to really consider all of the particles that are in solution here. So here we've got NaCl. NaCl is aqueous because it's got a group one metal. So it's going to split into Na plus and Cl minus. So it's got a Van't Hoff factor of two. Our molarity is given. Our molarity is 1.35 molar. Gas constant, um, it was on, actually I didn't put it there, but I will be giving you that anyway. It's 0 0.08206 um, liter atmospheres, moles Kelvin, uh, a couple other things. And then temperature is going to be 25 degrees Celsius, but plus 273.15. This works out to be 298, yeah, just 298 Kelvin. So plugging all this in, we have 2 times 1.35 times 0 0.08206 times 298. Atmospheric pressure here, osmotic pressure here is a lot higher than I thought it would be. Um, this is 66, sig figs, 66.0 atms. Now here, again, we have the same concentration only difference is our Van't Hoff factor. Ammonium sulfate, ammonium is always soluble. This is going to split into two ammoniums and a sulfate. By the way, guys, I really hope you're hitting pause and working these before I start. It's really going to set you up for success on the exam. So our Van't Hoff factor here is three. Just same as before, osmotic pressure is equal to Van't Hoff times molarity times R times T, which is equal to three times 1.35 molar times 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times 298 Kelvin. This is molar. This time we have 3 times 1.35 times 0 0.08206 times 298 and we end up getting 99.0 atms. Oops. Okay. Moles per liter cancels, Kelvin cancels. Van't Hoff factor is just a number, so we are left with um, atmospheres. So, yay. Okay, so 39 milligrams of an unknown volatile non-volatile compound, meaning it doesn't split apart, is dissolved in 20 milliliters of water. The osmotic pressure is, <laughs> the solution now has an osmotic pressure of 558 torr. Calculate the molar mass of the unknown. Now, uh, make sure you're hitting pause, you're getting there, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and work on this. So here, we've got 558 torr, we want atmospheres. We know that there's 760 torr and one atmosphere. This is going to give us 0 0.73 atm. Okay, so now we have that. 
Um, we have, so let me go ahead and write this down really quick. I M R T. In terms of temperature, 25 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 gives us 298.15, which rounds to 298 sig figs. We also have, um, so we have this. It tells us that our I is 1. We have the gas constant and we have liters, so we can solve for moles here. So let's go ahead and plug in what we know. Um, actually, I'm going to rewrite this first. Let's do that. So osmotic pressure is equal to I times liters per mole. Oh, I'm sorry. Thinking of the gas constant. Moles per liter times the gas constant times the T. So now we have one. We don't know the number of moles. Uh, that's the only thing we don't know. So here we have an osmotic pressure of 0 0.734 atmospheres is equal to 1 times moles over 20 milliliters or 0 0.0 zero two liters times the gas constant of point zero eight two oh six units times the temperature of two ninety eight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and solve for this on both sides. So that gives me 0 0.734 atms. On this side I have 1 times 0 0.08206 times 298. And then because this is on the bottom it gets divided. And so we end up getting uh, one, two, okay, watching your units, liters cancels, um, Kelvin cancels, we're now going to have to move it across, but one, two, two, two point seven moles. Um, and then atmospheres, this is actually atmospheres per mole, those are the two units that didn't cancel times moles. Okay, so dividing this both sides by this 1227 ATMs per mole. This is now going to cancel our atmospheres. 1 over 1 over moles is going to be moles. So 0.734 divided by 1222.7. We end up getting, uh, where am I going to write this? 6.00 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. That's not really what it's looking for. It's looking for molar mass. So we have our grams, 39 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams and 1 gram. So it's 0 0.039 grams. We have grams, we have moles. All we have to do is plug it in to get molar mass. Grams over moles here. So we have 0 0.0390 grams over, actually there's no zero there, over 6.00 times 10 to the neg negative 4 moles. So here, our molar mass should be 64.9 or 65 grams per mole. Honestly, when you go into your sample questions for this unit, I tried to ask you these things in every which direction. I also tried to change the numbers quite a bit so that you can go in and regenerate in those optional quizzes. And what that does is it means that you can try these problems 20, 30 times, however many times it takes. If it takes you twice and you get it, good. If not, there is practice made for you in those um, in those. Uh, optional quizzes. Now guys, the whole point of this is we have pressure um, from, the, we have the osmotic pressure. You can actually use 
reverse osmosis by applying a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure and it will force the solvent out of that concentrated side. So you can end up like purifying water that's got things dissolved in it by pushing it through a semi-permeable membrane leaving the ions and stuff behind. It's not the best way to do it just because the more you remove the more the pressure is going to go up and it takes more and more energy but it does work for a while. Osmosis in cells for my bio people applications here you want to have osmosis your blood cells have a semi-permeable membrane that is good because it means we can get signal molecules we can get other things happening which is good um, flowing in and out but when you need an IV it has to be an isotonic solution isotope iso means same so you want the solution to have the same concentration of your components. You use an IV that's got just a little bit of salt uh, because that is how much is in your blood and it keeps the flow of water normal through your cells. If you add just plain uh, water, you add water to your blood, it means you're adding a hypotonic solution. It doesn't have as many ions in there as the other solution does. So it's going to flow into the blood cells trying to make those concentrations equal and it'll end up bursting your cells. Hypertonic solutions have too much hyper meaning hyperactive hyper stuff. Uh, it's got too much and so the water will flow out of your cells trying to make the concentration equal. Um, it, that's why they tell you not to drink seawater is it's a hypertonic solution. It will make you so sick and it will really it, it causes these to um, oh it's a C word it causes them to shrivel so it's not good other applications when you're cooking pasta you can add salt to raise the boiling point I don't know pasta might cook faster in a higher boiling point I'm not really sure IV fluids for osmotic pressure and other things for health reasons Antifreeze. It is amazing like what antifreeze does now compared to what it did 50 years ago. By making a solution, you can have your engine both not have water that boils, the coolant doesn't boil, um, and it also doesn't freeze in high and low temperatures. And so your car actually works much, much better. De-icing planes and roads we talked about. Um, there's also this, I found this um, the other day when I was looking for other applications. This is a frog that is completely frozen, but technically he's not dead. Because of the amount of solution in his, in his body, like he has ions and things that are in his blood, he is not, his cells aren't rupturing, he is not actually died, he's just frozen temporarily. Same thing ha happens with plants. You get the plants that uh, freeze, but the cells do not rupture because the water itself inside their cells has not frozen. Um, it's the same kind of with like ice cream. We put ice cream in the freezer and so we say it's frozen, but because of the amount of stuff in the ice cream itself, about 30% of the, the water in ice cream does not freeze. And so that gives you a nice soft texture. It's not like an ice cube. It's ice cream. I mean, you know. Um, meringue, same thing. You can use meringue in desserts because it will uh, also not freeze. Um, it also has a much more interesting texture at higher points than other things. Um, we talked about the solubility of, of the vapor pressure of affecting so uh, because of the pressure, oh, golly, soda. It's also applicable to soda. We'll go with that. Now, um, when you go back through these, remember that you need to both know the colligative properties and be able to calculate the different components here. That is going to be the hardest thing. So if you look at that, um, just make sure you can do the calculations in addition to understand the concepts.